A few months ago, I came up with a hypothetical sci-fi scenario that gained a decent amount of traction online. Actually, even John Carmack, the creator of Doom, weighed in and shared some of his opinions on the scenario. So the simulation was, what would happen if humans forgot how to make CPUs? What hardware would stand the test of time? Or what computers would be the first to degrade? Now, this isn't really that crazy of a scenario. When a manufacturing line gets interrupted, humans can forget really quickly. Like with Sony and CRTs, with the Department of Energy and Fog Bank, or even with the original Saturn V F1 engine. Now, this is, of course, a completely hypothetical scenario, but I think it's really interesting to consider. So picture this. You've entered the final days of manufacturing, where the last chips have been created, and no new silicon designs are ever going to be manufactured again. This is Zero Tapeout Day, which I'm going to call Z-Day. Now, tapeout is the final stage of the integrated circuit design process, where designs are sent over to the fabs for manufacturing. But on this day, no new designs are going to be created, and no new chips are going to be manufactured. Assuming we keep our existing supply, let's simulate this scenario. I don't know what Oh, it's a pirate ship. <laughs> With a real pirate on board. <laughs> Z-Day plus one. It's been one year since CPU manufacturing ended. Cloud providers were the first ones to take the initial hit. Remember the days of small SaaS products? Those are already starting to die, with smaller startups taking the initial hit. The reason? Computing prices have skyrocketed. Now standing up infrastructure in the cloud has become a significant financial investment with a very uncertain future. The world had to learn a hard lesson, and that lesson is called Black's Equation. Black's Equation measures a semiconductor's mean time to failure due to electromigration. Now, electromigration is the gradual displacement of metal atoms inside of a wire due to the constant flow of electrons inside. In CPU terms, this basically means that there's electricity constantly flowing between transistors, and this displaces the metal atoms inside, causing the wire to decay and then the overall chip to fail. Inverse of what you might expect, older machines fare better against electromigration than newer machines. The reason is that chip manufacturing Manufacturing has gotten so efficient these days that the node sizes have drastically decreased. But a modern 5 nanometer CPU is orders of magnitude more susceptible to electromigration than an older 250 nanometer CPU from 20 years ago. Savvy consumers saw what was coming. They started undervolting and cooling their CPUs since day one of Z Day to squeeze out a few additional years of life. Obviously, the less dense the electron flow between the wires, the less amount of electromigration, and then the longer the chip is able to survive. As a quick aside, let's talk about the world of software development and how it would change in this scenario. When I first posted this thought experiment, John Carmack had some interesting additions to add about how the world of software would change in this particular situation. He said that more of the world than you might expect could run on outdated hardware if software optimization was truly a priority. Now, I'm inclined to agree with this. And the best example would be if you look at vintage console hobbyists and some of the projects that they do in 2025 for the Nintendo 64, for example. If you look at Kay's on YouTube, he rewrote the entire code for Super Mario 64 so that it was four times faster than the original game. Whoa. <laughs> I got one person. <laughs> one person waved for me, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been pretty sad if nobody had. It's okay. And of course, you can't forget about the demo scene. Tons of programmers compete every year to squeeze out the absolute most from highly performance-constrained hardware. After Z-Day, I'd expect to see a large resurgence in software optimizations to squeeze out the last bit from our remaining hardware. All right, back to the simulation. I'm just gonna shout across the water. Hey, what do you think if, what would happen if CPUs weren't manufactured anymore? 
I'm gonna get some priceless responses. Now it's three years post Z-Day, and black market chip sales have started to become a thing. Governments began intervening when they realized they needed to prioritize vital infrastructure like power, comms, or even the stock market to avoid a sudden economic crisis. Military supply is still okay and stable as they're relying on stockpiles of spare parts, but consumers are really starting to hurt and are willing to pay obscene amounts for chips. Enterprise-grade CPUs like Xeons are worth more than gold at this point. Luxuries like PC gaming have greatly reduced, and compute-intensive tasks like cryptocurrency mining have already been banned in the EU. I think the general public now understands the vital importance for processor conservation, but all that did was result in widespread hoarding. Are you vlogging? Yeah. Want to be on? Woohoo! <laughs> Lori Wired! Oh, there's another one. Cloud computing has actually started to shrink at this point as data centers enter crisis mode. Server parts start to fail unpredictably, causing data centers to desperately strip parts from donor boards, producing Frankenstein machines from cannibalized hardware parts. But nothing can stop the overall supply from declining. It's been seven years since Z-Day and portable computing devices are finally dying. Smartphone socks are experiencing soldering fatigue, leading to degradation of the precious chip inside. The less obvious killer, however, here is battery deterioration, as modern lithium-ion batteries are facing strong supply difficulties. As for the internet, most people still have a connection, but the threat is in the air, as core hardware components like switches are starting to reach end of life. Neighborhoods are starting to slowly go offline as consumer routers are dying, and even ISPs are starting to run low on switches. It's leading to this overall sentiment that the internet is slowly fracturing and we're starting to lose touch with parts of the world. Hello, friends. Geese friends, please don't chase me. Yeah. One of the less foreseen outcomes is the demand for used, dumb cars. Now, these vehicles have to be from the 90s or earlier before modern engine control units were common. Older cars were mostly mechanical, although modern vehicles use tens, if not over a hundred microprocessors. Vehicles experience a ton of thermal cycling, with the temperature constantly going up and down. And this isn't even accounting for the fact that they have to be able to run in all different kinds of weather. Unfortunately, the lead-free solder inside of the ECU starts to crack under this constant temperature cycling. And this also isn't even accounting for the modern smart car components like tablets that were expensive to replace and also unreliable even prior to Z-Day. It's been 15 years since Z-Day and the internet no longer exists as a single fabric after its gradual fragmenting. Critical ISP hardware continued its gradual decay, and so most individuals are forced to rely on fragmented private networks or individual peering connections. These aren't really used by the general public, though, and are mostly reserved for official use. Some highly privileged individuals can rely on private fiber optic cabling or even satellite comms. These are really only reserved for a few elite. Whoa. For the regular people, some were able to avoid hardware confiscations by being able to justify their status as essential personnel or be able to prove they possessed exceptional skills. For those lucky enough to have their own hardware, SneakerNet has become popular again, which just means carrying drives back and forth between computers. SSDs are the most used in this case since careful usage of them has managed to keep them alive longer than the network switches. For the operating systems themselves, boot to RAM and pre-boot execution environment or PXE images have become the norm. These reduce or even eliminate the number of day-to-day -day writes to the SSD, thus prolonging the lifespan just by a little bit. With every write of data to disk, people almost feel the cost of it, so they really have to make sure that the data is worthwhile to hold on to. Is that a sauna in a boat? It's a floating sauna. What on earth? 
<laughs> Never heard of that in my life. Hard disk drives are already well past the bathtub curve and are no longer reliable. Actually, most are just completely dead. They don't hold up nearly as well as SSDs against time because of all the delicate, constantly moving and spinning components. Data centers are carefully salvaging spindle motors and actuator arms from other drives in order to keep critical large storage arrays functioning properly. These kinds of repairs require cannibalized parts from other drives, as well as hyper-precision repairs themselves, which makes it difficult for anybody else to try to perform these repairs. I think it's time for a gummy worm break. These are my friends on the bench. Can't see. Old English 800. And cigarettes. <laughs> I have good friends. <laughs> We've made it to 30 years post Z-Day, and as you can see, a lot has changed. If you're a regular consumer, don't even think of trying to find a working computer from after 1990. Vintage computing has become the new standard, although only the elite are able to get sophisticated workstations like the fancier iMac G3. As for storage, the SSDs finally eventually failed from data rot. Even though they don't rely on the delicate mechanical parts that hard disk drives do, they still rely on electrical charge stored inside of NAND cells. When SSDs are regularly powered in, they'll go through and find fading cells and rewrite the data to refresh them. Over the years, without those periodic refreshes, the data literally fades away. Long-term storage has shifted entirely over to optical media like CDs and DVDs that don't require anything mechanical or electronic. It's funny that in the end, the great accomplishments with node size efficiency ended up being the downfall of modern computing. Vintage machines lasted much better, like Game Boys, Macintosh SEs, and Commodore 64s. In fact, the Motorola 68000s, which are the CPUs inside of Mac SEs, have a projected lifespan of over 10,000 years, with a whopping node size of 3.5 micrometers. The whole state of computing much more closely resembles that of the 1970s and 1980s now. It's fascinating to think about what aspects of technology and even the world would change if we suddenly lost the ability to manufacture CPUs. Most people's minds go to things like personal computers, phones, or the internet. But if you think about it, the things that matter most are actually primarily on microcontrollers. I think this is a much better apocalypse scenario than all of the zombie movies out there. Hollywood should hit me up. I like to think of these underground movements popping up where electrical engineers try to desperately fabricate new transistor designs in their homes. And actually a really good real world example of that is Jerry Ellsworth, who has a series from like 14 years ago where she made homemade transistors and diode designs from scratch. And Jerry is just an amazing engineer and inspiration, so definitely go check out her stuff. Even if this hypothetical Z-Day scenario did occur, it wouldn't be completely unrecoverable. People forget we had an entire era of computing long before we had modern transistors. We had vacuum tubes long before transistors. Actually, we got through all of World War II without modern CPUs. Enigma was broken with rotors. So what about you? Do you have your own theories on what would happen? Do you have ideas on what technology would last the longest or what technology would start to fail first? Debate it out in the comments section below. So as always, thank you so much for watching everyone. I hope you enjoyed this video. Lori wired out. This is a seaplane. Can't see it, ironically enough. You'll be able to write a C program so you can see it. <laughs>